the coordinators of the study group. Um, and I'm going to give a short introduction to this, uh, to this particular segment and the transition from part one to part two of, uh, that we are starting today and, um, and talk about the Psychosocial Foundation. And then I'm going to introduce uh, uh, Gabe Winnen, our speaker today, um, who will give a presentation. And then after the presentation, we're actually going to poll you all to try to decide if we want to do breakout rooms. There uh, will probably be less than 40 people in the breakout rooms. So uh, whether that's a priority or not, or we want to keep it as a whole group discussion and have a slightly shorter program uh, will be up to all of us. So um, uh, the Psychosocial Foundation is coordinating this whole arc of educational work and lectures and programs and classes coming up. Um, and in uh, one of its main public projects is the Parapraxis magazine that we're editing the first issue at the moment. And the first issue is about the family. <coughs> about the family problem. And the whole magazine and the foundation, from what I understand, is very much trying to think the psychic dimensions of psychoanalysis, human development, consciousness, the unconscious, alongside the fact that we live in a society, in a society structured by capitalism, by racial antagonisms, by social structures and systems of violence and domination and impersonal domination. And that this is both has a profound effect in sh shaping a psychic life, affects what happens in the clinic room. And conversely, perhaps psychoanalysis sometimes has something to offer trying to think about the social world the family is a is a very charged and very interesting side of all this as a really central object of psychoanalysis on the one hand, and then also an institution of class society and an institution that is a central organizing fulcrum of gender uh, relations, gender roles, sexuality, sexual orientation uh, in the historic organization of white supremacy. So the family really kind of concretizes all of these very tense and interesting relationships between the psychic and the social. Um, we structured the seminar and to, at, in a very different way, the magazine, the first issue around trying to think about these things in dialogue and what they have to learn from each other. And I'd say sort of particularly putting into relation psychoanalytic debates on the family and um, those sort of collection of political frameworks that have had some influence in what's called family abolition these days. So mostly in communist theory, but also drawing from queer and trans radicalism, from black feminism, from Marxism, from a variety of political traditions. And so we structured the seminar so that part one was sort of classical writing about the family. Part two is like revolutionary horizon, right? Like stuff that has informed family abolitionism, both thinking about the family as an institution within capitalist society and thinking about the overcoming of the family as a, as a dimension of overthrowing class society. Um, and so, you know, we have various segments and then part three is contemporary psychoanalytic writings on the family debates that are partially to varying extents slightly informed by critiques of the family, particularly informed by radical feminist and queer critiques of the family in the 1960s and 70s, but also by black feminism and a lot of Afro pessimism and other political traditions that have, you know, seeped into psychoanalysis and perhaps in the arc of this uh, uh, seminar and the magazine might seep into psychoanalysis, but also psychoanalysis have something to offer critically and thoughtfully in response to them. So that's the overall idea of the seminar. So this is part two, where we are thinking about capitalism and the revolutionary horizon. And Ingalls has played such a monumental and complex role in shaping the thinking on the family by, the, by many segments of the left, particularly the Marxist left, but by no means limited to that. And we're going to hear a little bit about this tradition, um, the sort of some of the debates from our speaker today. Um, so that's that's my overview. Um, so 
Gabriel Winnett is an assistant professor of history at the University, University of Chicago. His first book, The Next Shift, The Fall of Industry and the Rise of Healthcare in Rust Belt America was published last year. His writing appears frequently in publications such as Descent, The Nation, and N Plus One. And he is uh, dear friends with a number of people working on the magazine, and so very much in a kind of ally of our work of fair praxis and psychosocial. And we're very honored to have him here today. Um, he's going to be speaking for 15 to 20 minutes. Please, Gabe, take us away. Okay, well, thank you, Michelle, for that warm introduction. Thanks to everyone for having me and for um, what well, I haven't been to any of the seminars yet, but I gather it's been uh, a very uh, rich and exciting experience so far. So I'm, I'm honored to join you all. Um, I, you know, I, I have to admit that I, in thinking about what I wanted to say today, um, I think I probably imagined my comments for an audience less sophisticated than this one. I'm now looking at this call and seeing all of the erudite and, and uh, brilliant comrades on this call who know these traditions as well or better than I, than I do. So uh, I, I will talk a bit and you know certainly kind of summarize and contextualize and lay out some of the kind of basic things that I think are useful in framing a conversation about uh, Engels, about Seacomb, and more broadly about class and family and the kind of Marxist feminist tradition. But I'm not going to be that argumentatively, interpretively ambitious here. And I'm hoping that we can kind of bring out more together uh, in, in conversation. And in particular, I'm really not going to put in any work at all to try to draw out direct links between the readings and, and psychoanalytic thought and traditions on the assumption that this group will be plenty able to do that together. Um, as Michelle said, um, the, the Engels text, which I think is worth spending a bit more time on right now, um, is an extremely classic one. Um, there were a variety of... Um, you know, very obviously early feminist uh, thinkers and writers, you know, long preceding this moment in the late 19th century. But uh, Engels's book, which we read a segment of for today, is such a landmark because it attempts in a quite complicated and ambiguous way, but nonetheless attempts to um, take on the question of uh, from where the family came in a way that would allow it allow the kind of Marxist concept of the mode of production to have something to say uh, about the organization of family. And although he wouldn't have used the word, it didn't have the word, the organization of gender itself at some level. Um, and I think it's just worth kind of summarizing what that intervention involves. Classically, Marxism breaks down the capitalist mode of production into two departments. I mean, Marx calls them department one and department two, the production of the means of production and the production of the means of subsistence. Um, and you know, much of, of capital is concerned with the kind of, especially in the later volume, is, is concerned with uh, developing the relationship between these departments. Uh, and as has been pointed out often since then, uh, there is a third term that's missing in that formula, which is the production of the supply of labor, um, which even on a quite narrow orthodox basis would seem like a kind of important factor uh, in, uh, in any kind of, um, in balancing any kind of equation about the laws of motion of the capitalist mode of production. And Marx certain, himself certainly writes at great length and with great frequency about the supply of labor and about its relationship to the, what's called the population question. He's very concerned with arguing with Malthus in particular, um, but he never really systematically addresses that problem, that question of what produces the labor supply, where it comes from, what kind of, um, what are the laws of motion of its own reproduction, we might say, and how do those relate to the contradictions that structure capital and its accumulation more broadly. Um, so in some ways, Engels is sort of attempting to take that on, uh, but it's just worth, I think, flagging that this is really the entry point through which socialist feminism made its intervention. Um, and uh, Engels, let me talk a bit more specifically about Engels now. I mean, for, uh, th this book, as you can see from what you, what you read for today, I'm sure many of you have read it before, um, has at one level a kind of basic debunking mission. It's in interested in drawing a genealogical uh, story of where the modern bourgeois family came from and where patriarchy, as it's you know in its modern form in the late 19th century, came from. That is something other than timeless, right? And that is, I think, the core of the power of the book. 
um, that the structure of the relationship of power uh, between men and women, as Engels sees it, uh, can actually be explained through the analysis of the development of modes of production. Uh, and if that's the case, then um, modern 19th century patriarchy is not timeless. And beyond that also, a socialist revolution should be expected in some way to transform, uh, to answer the, the what was called the woman question, right? And to transform it in some regard. Um, and the argument that Engels makes, um, which I'll critique in a moment, but the argument that he makes basically is organized around a kind of conceptual interaction between um, the incest taboo, which I thought would be interesting to flag for, for this group, uh, the, the early accumulation of kind of what he would call primitive forms of property and the principle of heredity. So uh, Engels draws, draws a kind of series of stages in uh, sort of prehistorical and early, early historical periods uh, from savagery to barbarism to civilization. Uh, and he corresponds to each of them a form of marriage. Uh, savagery is corresponded to group marriage in which uh, whole groups of men and women are married to one another in a kind of like multi-polygamous formation. Um, savagery in his schema gives way to what he calls barbarism. Um, so this would be a kind of, like if we were to attempt, which we shouldn't really do, but if we were to attempt to map this onto actual human history, uh, this would be a kind of transition from like, um, the Neolithic period, more or less, of um, or even the kind of Paleolithic period, uh, in which you know we're roughly talking about like hunting and gathering. That's what he seems to be imagining, into kind of early um, settled agricultural societies, um, which are characterized by what he calls the pairing family, which is a sort of transitional phenomenon in his schema, um, in which. Um, while there's still kind of various polygamous formations, uh, particular associations of two are kind of becoming more prominent. Uh, and then barbarism gives way to civilization, um, again, in his schema, which is characterized by the emergence of monogamy. Um, and it's just worth saying a word about the sources that, from which he's getting this, as you all have seen, he's drawing very heavily from 19th century colonialist anthropology, in particular, uh, Lewis Morgan is the kind of key influence here. And there are a number of mistakes that that leads Engels to make. Um, I mean, one, the kind of classic one would be the projection backward eternally in time of uh, people and forms of life that are classified by the European observer as uh, frozen in a kind of eternal past, right? This is a kind of classic problem of the colonial anthropological gaze is that it sees its others as not just elsewhere in, social and geographical space, but also as elsewhere in time, specifically back, backward in time. Um, and so then attempts to infer off of that, the European past. Um, and that's of course connected to a kind of orthodox or classical Marxist um, stagism, right? Which Engels deals in very, very heavily, right? There's a kind of quite fixed series of stages and the transitions are maybe a little bit fuzzy and a little bit contingent, but basically, um, the uh, particular social formation must develop through these stages. And there is a kind of basically necessary correspondence between, in this case, um, the uh, ownership of property and, and the organization of property and the organization of family. Um, nonetheless, the kind of key argument that Engels makes here is that um, in the transition from uh, basically in the kind of barbarism period and in the transition from barbarism to civilization, something occurs which he describes as the world historic uh, defeat of the female sex in which um, what, what he describes as mother right, that's to say um, matrilineal inheritance uh, is overthrown by father right. And this has to do with the accumulation of increasing scales of property, particularly property in um, domesticated animal herds uh, which men uh, develop be, have a particular kind of role in managing and develop a kind of growing interest in the control of the heredity uh, or the inheritance of that property. I think what's really interesting about this and worth thinking about more is that although Engels here offers a kind of very important central even starting point for the socialist feminist tradition that 
you know, many, many writers of a later period of the 60s, 70s, and 80s uh, will avow their own deaths to in a variety of ways. This is a socialist feminism that's not actually about reproductive labor, at least not on the surface. Um, it's about the organization of family and the production of children and the question of the inheritance of property through those children. But Engels is actually not really able to observe uh, women and feminized labor uh, as a kind of suppressed element in modern capitalism, particularly. And in fact, um, the way he, that he concludes this argument and the stakes of it for him, as I think largely for Marx and even for uh, their women comrades like Clara Zetkin in this moment of the early 19th century, or early 20th century in the Second International, the stakes of uh, the kind of socialist feminism that they think they're developing um, is to allow the true realization of uh, kind of free, what he calls sex love within the monogamous parent. Uh, that uh, because proletarianization and the emergence of uh, the working class as a revolutionary agent makes it possible to, or as a potential revolutionary agent makes it possible to uh, detach questions of heredity because the proletariat is propertyless by definition and uh, need not concern itself in socialism with questions of inheritance, makes it possible to detach, therefore, heredity from love and sex and family. Um, what it is assumed that socialism will mean is the uh, kind of free flowering of sex love in monogamous relations. Um, and I think that is quite closely related in some important ways to the uh, failure of angles to uh, approach the question of women's subordination in terms of their labor. Um, although I think it's quite easy to read an argument about women's labor into his argument. He is not himself doing that. It not, does not quite seem to have the resources himself to do that. Um, but I don't wanna to be too hard on Engels. The book is extremely important, um, obviously. And you know, a, a century later, it will be a very common kind of touchstone for many, many other participants in these debates on kind of all sides in various complex ways of the Marxism and feminism debates of the 1970s and 1980s. Uh, I gather that next week is so, or next session is social reproduction theory. Uh, so I don't think it makes sense for me here to necessarily lay out much of the landscape of debate um, as that tradition kind of reignites in the 1970s and 80s. But let me just say a couple more things about Engels and I'll move on briefly to Wally Seacombe. Um, you know, I think we now know that uh, there's very little of the kind of empirics of this account that would really, we would really want to defend in any specific form um, for the various reasons I've, I've said it's reliance on anthropology and the way that, it, that, that he's doing, it, you know, the, the understanding that he has of ancient history, which is in some ways quite good for his moment, but nonetheless, uh, you know, we wouldn't want to import directly into our own. I think the value of this text is uh, not in actually giving us a kind of direct guide to the kind of proper historical origins of, as he calls it, the world historic overthrow, uh, uh, world historic defeat of the female sex, um, but rather for the kind of, one, the genealogical move that he makes, and then two, the genealogical relation in which we stand to him. Um, and the ways that, Engels' ambivalence about what it would, uh, about the relationship between marriage and monogamy and sex love on the one hand and the mode of production on the other, the way that he, his argument doesn't really necessarily seem to require a kind of monogamous outcome, but nonetheless he imposes that on it, um, I think is a, um, generative contradiction for us to think with in the present as we think about the shape of the debates that emerge from this text over time. Um, okay, then very briefly, I'll just talk about Wally Seacombe a bit. Um, so Wally Seacombe is a participant, a quite important participant in debates in the 70s and 80s, uh, in the kind of moment of reignition of socialist and Marxist feminist traditions that came out of um, the social struggles and political struggles of the 1960s. And um, 
by profession, he's a sociologist or really even kind of a or discipline rather, but he's a demographer, really. I think he would call himself a demographer. And that's a quite interesting position to be in. Um, as he has written, Marxists generally have been quite leery of demography as a form of social knowledge uh, for many good reasons. I mean, one, the kind of classic version of the population question uh, and the kind of polemics between Marx and or, or by Marx against Malthus have generally caused Marx, Marxists and people in the Marxist tradition to treat population as not itself necessarily deserving of investigation and population dynamics as not really having their own logics that are important. Obviously then again, in the late 20th century, or mid, mid and late 20th century, um, well really across the entire 20th century, um, there are kind of populationist politics that we would want to oppose very strong, very you know, firmly. Um, and, uh, Seacombe is very interested in trying to figure out what we might want to do with thinking about population without necessarily committing ourselves to, or well, resisting committing ourselves to any of the, the traditions that people on the left and radicals have steered clear of. Um, so as you saw, as you can see in Weathering the Storm, and this is true throughout his work, he does really take quite seriously um, the we might say relative autonomy in some ways of population dynamics that that formula that I began this discussion with the third department along with the, the production of the means of production and the productions of the of the means of subsistence the idea that the production of uh, the population is a department that's a formulation that I took directly from him I mean others would say that too but um, and uh, he's also an important participant in what's often what's been called the domestic labor debate of the 1970s and 1980s about the question of the particular relationship of housework to value production. And that's a debate on which um, basically autonomist feminist, Mar Marxist feminists like Sylvia Federici and Maria Rosa della Costa and Selma James on one side, and what we would call social reproduction theorists on the other side have kind of disagreed and, engaged and had polemics over the years about exactly what relationship uh, unwaged domestic labor bears to value production. We don't need to litigate that right now or go through the details of that right now, I think. Um, but Seacomb occupied a kind of middle position in that debate. Um, but here, I think what's important about the argument that he's making in, in weathering the storm um, is, first of all, his insistence that population dynamic to understand population dynamics, we have to understand power struggles within the household, which is, of course, not news in the feminist tradition, but uh, is a point that he is, I think, bringing into you know the analysis of the mode of production in a way that um, many Marxists, as well as the kind of economists that he's talking to, have largely ignored. And he identifies um, in, in analyzing the demographic transition of the early 20th century. He identifies in particular four mechanisms uh, that distinguish the demographic transition and. Uh, which happened largely within marriage. So I think the key distinction that, or a key distinction that Seacombe is interested in drawing is that the, unlike previous moments of fertility decline, um, which have been about declining rates of marriage um, or changing ages of marriage or that kind of thing, uh, the demographic transition of the early 20th century, which is an enormous demographic watershed, um, largely happens within marriage and it happens through increased abortion, through coitus interruptus, through abstention and through the increasing use of uh, contraceptive devices. Um, and in particular, there's a significant increase in vaginal devices, diaphragm, cervical caps. Um, and for this to happen, uh, Seacomb reconstructs what some of the kind of, what we can see of some of the political struggles within the household between husbands and wives must have looked like as the struggle over, uh, as women engage in a struggle over conjugal rights, men's sexual access, access and expectation. But he also links this to uh, a ch the changing value, economic value of children. The children go from an asset to a cost over the period of the late 19th and early 20th century. Uh, and I'm gonna read to you a quotation here. Uh, employers gradually converted from an extensive to an intensive mode of consuming labor power. Domestic commodity production declined, leaving women with fewer ways to earn money at home. Young children were withdrawn from factories and sent to school in the face of mass campaigns against their exploitation in industry. The labor, labor movement fought to define a living wage as a wage sufficient to sustain a working man's family, and proletarian families came to rely more than ever before on his income to survive. <laughs> 
These shifts in the family economy, occurring first among the upper layers of the working class, raised the costs and curtailed the eventual benefits of bearing additional children. In response, working class families eventually brought their fertility into line with the new production regime. Breaking with an extensive mode of production, whereby women had continued to bear children until menopause, proletarian parents intensified the investment of time, energy, and resources devoted to each child. And he's very insistent that here what we're seeing is a connection between the dynamics of capital, uh, that's the shift from the extensive to the intensive use of labor, a connection between that and the dynamics of reproduction within the family, but that, that connection he describes as culturally mediated within a loose equilibration. And I think this is really important to understanding what Seacombe is doing, that he wants to draw links between the different departments, as I was putting it earlier, or between production and reproduction, we might say that these, these things are elements of a larger totality, but that the relation between them isn't mechanistic or deterministic, um, and in fact is played out and mediated through um, struggles in particular within the family. Um, there are three key consequences of this, of this transformation that he sketches out. One is shortening of childbearing years, creating the phenomenon of re-entry into labor markets for women, which he describes as the breach where the floodgate eventually opened. The second is uh, the end of what he calls procreative fatalism, which eventually leads to um, a quite systematic or dramatic delinking of uh, sex and procreation and eventually what's called the second demographic transition in the later 20th century when uh, fertility rates fall further in particular after the uh, availability of widespread availability of pharmaceutical birth control. And then finally, the rise of the concept of the, or the idea of the priceless child and the emergence of the child-centered family. And here, I think there might be an interesting connection for, again, for this group to pursue. Um, so I think Seacomb is someone who um, is one of many who has kind of helped pursue and develop what Engels laid down. Obviously, there are many others who have done so as well. Um, but I think the question, you know, for us both as kind of thinkers and people engaged in political struggle in the present and people who are trying to kind of make sense of psychic and social connections uh, is about wh where and how to identify kind of generative points of struggle uh, that link the intimate world, right, of the family, the self of reproduction and sex and sexuality to the kind of structural. Um, and I think he helps us sort of see how, or he does that for one moment, right? But he, I think he also provides us tools uh, for trying to do that about our own moment. Uh, and that's, I think, another thing we might talk about some. So I'll stop there. Um, and I guess I, now we can just have discussion. I'm happy to answer questions if that's helpful, although I wanna hear what others think as well. Thanks. Thank you so much, Gabe. That was really an excellent presentation. Um, I, to structure the discussion a little bit, I want to do a part now where we really focus on trying to understand Ingalls and Sikum, and we hear whatever we want to ask Gabe and share thoughts specifically about these texts and the political tradition they represent, and do that for about 10 minutes and then shift gears either in small groups or in the whole discussion to bridging it with psychoanalysis and to thinking psychoanalytic theory and, and research alongside this political tradition. Um, so just to start off, uh, are there direct questions for Gabe uh, around these texts and his presentation that um, people would like to put out or alternatively, sort of comments or thoughts uh, and questions broadly, really considering these texts on their own terms. Okay, yes, Michael. Hi, um, thanks for the great presentation. My question's about the long historical trajectory of the family and two key watersheds in this. So Engels is um, linking monogamy um, 
and this kind of new type of family to kind of ancient Greece and Rome and the institution of um, inheritance through the paternal line. Does Engels or, or like anyone else give us an idea of what, um, what form of the family is specific to capitalism that comes in a bit later? I mean, I know someone like Federici has things to say about this with the severe outlawing of contraception at that time. Um, Angela Metropolis talks about um, the kind of the, the coinciding of, of the household with, with blood ties, which isn't something you see in ancient Greece and Rome because the household consists of slaves as well that are part of the household. Um, I'm wondering if Engels or anyone else gives us this. I have another quest, a similar question about Fordism, but maybe I'll just leave it there for now. Thanks. Uh, sure. Uh, uh I'll add to this question a little because it was the question that I had in my head that that a lot of Marx um, really marks this dramatic shift between feudalism and the organization of capitalism around around all, all sorts of social dimensions. And so often that's a rupture that Marxists are very preoccupied with. And Ingalls in this book and elsewhere is much more interested in the transition to civilization what we might call a kind of consolidated organized class society and like the i'm uh, interested in both the empirical question michael posed about the differences of the family and capitalism and how the shift in periodization sort of what it means for how ingles theorizes and how we understand the family like to what extent is the bourgeois family an intensification of the feudal family to what extent is it a rupture that Ingalls doesn't quite see, things like that. Yeah, it's a great question. And actually, uh, Wally Seacombe's other book uh, is really great for this, which is about the uh, family through the transition from feudalism to capitalism. Um, but uh, I think you're, I mean, the questions are absolutely right to observe that although Engels is interested in bringing family into the, or would appear to be interested in bringing family into the kind of analysis of the mode of production, actually, he's not really dealing in the categories of mode of production. He's dealing in, the, in these kind of basically racial categories, right? Although he was not quite articulating it that way either uh, of um, savagery, barbarism, and civilization. Um, and, uh, once you have civilization, um, you have monogamy, which then the bourgeois family is just a kind of uh, perfection of the principle of uh, a certain kind of property, or I shouldn't say that rather, the bourgeois family is contradictory rather because uh, the bourgeois family both um, brings forward in time the, the kind of older linkage between monogamous marriage and, and patriarchy and property inheritance on the one hand, um, but also the bourgeois family is contradictory in that um, it, because it's no longer, it, it has a kind of element of liberal freedom from status bondage, status-based bondage also kind of makes possible a collapse for Engels into a, a genuine monogamy, which is free from kind of questions of property inheritance. But there, it's true actually. So this is like, you kind of caught me all in a slippage in my own analysis. And I think you, you have caught Engels in a slippage in his own analysis. It's true that the bourgeois mode of production as an actual kind of mode of production with its own logic doesn't really seem to figure in important ways here. Um, and I think it's to that that Seacombe, is as well as many others, is addressing much of his analysis because he would argue that um, the family form, the nuclear family form that's kind of characteristic of the capitalist mode of production can't be projected back even into feudalism, much less further. That um, in the transition from feudalism to capitalism, uh, I mean, it's been long and widely acknowledged that there are kind of important demographic dimensions in that. And the debate about that transition often has much to do with, on the one hand, um, the consequences of plague on population and labor supply. And on the other hand, the commodification of the reproduction of enslaved people. Um, but uh, so we know that there's a kind of demographic element to transition, um, but nonetheless, it's, it's often been argued in kind of mainstream social history that the nuclear nuclear family predates the transition as a kind of dominant mode of familial organization, at least in Europe. Uh, and 
I think Seacomb is quite effective in showing the ways that that's not the case. And it's in fact, um, the, nuclear fam the nuclear family is a kind of, uh, for the proletariat, is a kind of um, survival uh, mechanism that is developed over the course of the industrial revolution in response to the so social pressure pressures of proletarianization. Okay, let's take uh, one more or perhaps two, uh, Eben Flo. Oh, your hand is raised uh, in the digital world of Zoom. Okay, so it looks like uh, Sophie, um, uh, you wrote a comment in the Zoom. Um, do you want to articulate it out loud? Um, before well, I don't know. I, I just, yeah, I mean, I'm just sort of uh, taking seriously what you said, Michelle, about uh, maybe, because we, I think Gabe invited this very flatteringly, to, oh, this is a very erudite audience and so on, you know, but like, I, I wondered if it would actually benefit us to sort of, before jumping even further, sort of simply seeing if we we're on the same page about what the, you know, how we would introduce what 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 Engel's question actually is and whether it's the same as as Seacombs. I don't know. I feel kind of bad dragging us back, but you know, you yeah, I just just trying to take seriously your prompt to make sure that that we, yeah, that that we that we, you know, know the readings or whatever. And Gabe did a great job. So um is it I do you want to pinpoint, Sophie, what is ambiguous there or what is worth more explication? Um, like or or your answers to these questions, <laughs> if the case may be. Uh, not really. <laughs> okay. So <laughs> let let's take a couple more questions before we put this to Gabe, uh, and we should uh, transition soon. So let's just do a couple more. Uh, Michalina. Hi. Um, so thanks for the introduction, it was great. Um, you mentioned um, Tetkin at one point, as does uh, Sakam um, in, in his chapter. Um, and it seems that you know, in recent years, there have been quite a lot of attempts to sort of recover figures of early 20th century socialist feminism as like these very obvious figures of, you know, somehow obvious of identification and inspiration for current movements. Um, and, you know, Sakam's example of contraception sort of shed this light on, you know, how non, not obvious these figures are and how often they actually, you know, sided with their political, political parties over the sort of interests and demands of the female proletariat that they were, you know, supposed to, you know, represent in some way. Um, and, you know, from what I've read, Sutkin was also, you know, extremely hostile to any sort of forms of gender, sort of transgression or fluidity that she sort of observed in Germany at the time, um, and sort of, you know, very openly queerphobic in that sense. Um, so I was wondering if you can sort of speak on the sort of um, maybe more, you know, female part of that tradition at the time. And you know these, you know, female figures, which you know are often made to be these, you know, obvious figures of identification for feminist, socially feminist movements now, and um, are not often, I guess, sort of um, read very carefully. <laughs> I, such a great um, question. So let's okay. it, put these both to Gabe, uh, uh, Abby, and Elias. I'm going to table your questions until after the break. Uh, so Gabe will answer these and then we will move to figuring out what we're going to do for the rest of the session. Those are two great questions. Uh, maybe I'll take them and do, my, and do my best in that kind of opposite order. Um, so to start with Michalina's question, um, I mean, I think, you know, it's very easy and sympathetic to um, get why present day socialists and socialist feminists are interested in having touchstones in the early 20th century in the kind of period of the second international or, or after. Um, and I don't begrudge that. I mean, I get where, you know, I think we can all understand where that comes from. Um, but I think, you know, uh, one thing we can take from Engels if nothing else is a kind of, a certain kind of genealogical kind of way of thinking. Um, I think we can sort of 
import that into this discussion here to ask, well, why did, you know, what, uh, what historical kind of sequence led the socialists and social democratic and labor parties and, and formations of that moment to have the kind of gender politics that they had. Um, and I think it's quite striking that those parties generally um, had their kind of original mass basis in um, the kind of respectable skilled layer of the proletariat uh, in the late 19th century as they took shape. Um, the, the kind of residual formations of, in particular, skilled craftsmen who uh, were able, as Seacomb talks about, in fact, in the reading for today, were able to some degree to um, control their fertility uh, and to ex you know, extract a relatively kind of respectable standard of living and to have a family wage and so on by the late 19th century, uh, I think really imbued the socialist movement of late 19th and early 20th century with much of its gender ideology. Um, and I think Engels himself in some ways is, re is reflecting that on, and then you know, uh, has sort of developed the theorization from that, that um, social context. Um, now one could argue, and I think Seacombe would argue um, that uh, you know, there is certain kind of contingent ways in which that logic of, you know, and certainly there have been socialist feminists even who've argued that the logic of the kind of family wage and the defense of the family unit as a kind of unit of survival um, involved women's participation politically as well. And uh, that there are certainly women and even women who might have called themselves in some ways uh, feminist, sort of uh, socialist feminists who um, participated in the campaigns for a living wage for a single breadwinner. Um, but it's out of that context of struggle, I think that you get figures like Zetkin, like Luxembourg, as we see her briefly in the Seacomb chapter. And it's striking that uh, the, count the obvious counterpoint to these figures would be the anarchists um, who were not for obvious reasons, as interested in kind of building durable organizations of, you know, at the, at the trade union level and at the party level, um, and did not therefore necessarily see the um, living wage male headed household, you know, of the kind of skilled or stable layer of the proletariat as the obvious social basis for their struggles. Um, so I guess that would be the kind of social context that I would give for those kinds of figures. Um, and I think it's out of that that you get these kind of what seem now quite um, jarring kinds of lines of analysis from figures like that again, um, because she was a person of her party. To uh, go to Sophie's question of what really is Engels's question, I mean, I think it's a very good question. I'm not sure I really know what the answer is um, when you put it that way. It seems to me like what Engels really wants to show, as is lots of contemporaries or slightly later figures like August Ebel, for example, uh, who wrote, I think, probably the most widely read book on socialism and the woman question, um, wanted to show was that uh, capitalism or the capitalist mode of production corrupts the morality of women and that, that this is a kind of reason for its overthrow. So to kind of continue from the previous answer, um, Right, sex work, adultery, uh, certainly excessive fertility, which is not a, quite a moral question in exactly the same way, but it's you know uh, is related. We might say um, are reflections of the ways that uh, the capitalist mode of production and the bourgeois family uh, can't actually deliver the goods that they would appear to promise um, to women, and in fact the reason that women should participate in the socialist movement, which certainly Bebel and Engels and Zetkin all thought they should, um, is because the thing that we that women really want, which is controlled fertility and a kind of respectable moral and sexual life is only available through socialism. Um, and I do think that that's basically what their line of analysis was. And I think, you know, it's possible for us to appropriate it for ourselves Nonetheless, without taking all of that on board or to at least appropriate parts of it for ourselves and to kind of appropriate some of the kind of problem ourselves without taking all of that on board. But I think we certainly can't do so blindly, right? Or otherwise we, we, we get a lot of that baggage. Uh, and I think we've seen that, that move attempted over the course of the kind of various revivals 
um, of angles of Zetkin and of, of similar figures or of this moment in the present that isn't able to disentangle um, the particular social basis and the you know, particular logics of struggle uh, that they were giving voice to. Great, thank you. Um, so we are going to um, shortly go to a break, but before we do, we have two very important polls for you all. Uh, the first is an actual Zoom poll. I'm going to send it out now. And it's uh, to what extent would you benefit from uh, small breakout rooms as a space for discussion? And the first question is, do you prefer us going to breakout rooms or with our relatively small group of under 50 people, do you prefer keep, keeping it as a large group? The second question is, um, would you share more in small groups? So even if you might not prefer it, or perhaps you would, at least you'd be able to be more free in sharing your thoughts and insights. And so we're going to use this to decide what to do at the end of our five minute break. The second poll, Hannah is going to put in the chat and is a Google form, and it's your overall evaluation of uh, our, the format, the arc of the seminars, and we're going to use for trying to decide moving forward about, um, uh, about whether to do breakout rooms or not, and in future seminars and whatnot. And we wanted to put it in the chat before the break so that we don't lose people. Is it uh, possible to share it, Hannah? Great. Okay, so I encourage everyone to fill out both. We will now do a five minute break. And based on the results, when we get back, we will either do a breakout room or a whole group discussion. Anything I'm forgetting, Hannah or Wendy? That sounds great to me. Okay, great, so, so five minute break. I enjoy the break and I'll see you back in a moment. Oh. And if you are not joining the breakout rooms or whatever, I, you do what you want to do. I'll see you all short. It's, yeah. Um, opening things, we are opening things up now to um, think the psychoanalytic alongside this discussion. And we had an initial question in the chat from Henrich or Henrik, and then Abby also has her hand up. And so, uh, and, you know, sharing whatever comes to mind, what you would like to talk about, we'll probably have a uh, uh, another, I guess, half hour or so for an open discussion. Okay, um, uh, Henrich or Henrik, um, my apologies. If do you, your question is interesting, an historical one. Um, do you want to verbalize it or do you want to summarize it? Or would you like me to? Uh, it's possible none of us know the answer to it, but we can see. Thanks, <laughs> it's Henrik, by the way. Um, Henrik, thank you. Yeah. Um, well, uh, like I wrote, uh, <clears throat> when I was reading the Engels text, I was struck by the similarities to Totem and Taboo, but it makes them sort of, it, draws, it seems to draw from the same sources or similar sources in the anthropology, and it sort of seems to draw similar conclusions as well. So I was wondering if Freud, I mean, seeing as he wrote Totem and Taboo at least 20 years following the Engels text, if he was aware of it at all, if he was in dialogue with it somehow, uh, and how does it relate to, um, you know, how do, how do they relate to each other, so to speak? Let's give Gabe the first uh, pass. I don't, I don't know the answer. I mean, I would defer okay. to uh, you know, someone who knows Freud better than me. Does anyone um, have informed speculation to offer? There has been a literature about uh, Freud's relationship to Marxism and exposure to the Marxist movement uh, in various biographies and articles and some evidence of which articles he might have come across here or there. Um, does any, any Freud scholars want to weigh in 
I mean, I mean, my guess, this is like a breadcrumb. I mean, my guess is just it's the shared, it's the shared interest in anthropology that leads them to this sort of um, shared speculation about, right, the beginning of, yeah. And I was going to say Pat's here. So I think <laughs> I'd love to hear Pat answer this question, but I think it's the, it's this transition between matriarchy to patriarchy comes out of a, uh, an anthropological knowledge of the, of the time. Pat, do you want to grace us with your voice? Well, that's very sweet. Hi, everyone. This was this is amazing. Uh, I mean, I, my question was actually going to be about sort of some trying to import some Freudian terms into that, but I, I wanted Abby. Abby's question actually was more. No, no, uh, we can get that. Okay, like I guess like what I was, what I was thinking about in in this uh, light or in regards to this was like. You know, Freud has these these comments in the anthropological works about you know communism being misguided or utopian, et cetera, right? And a lot of it seems to to boil down to um, like I'd say two things, right? One is like this question of stageism, right? In some ways, in, in the way in like there's and and I'm not a, I'm not very good as a, Mar a scholar of Marxism, so I'm, I want to be enlightened about this, but like that there isn't a inevitable linearity to the way things develop and that much as like the unconscious is kind of timeless certain social forms or like social exigencies abide right and and to give an example of this right i'm thinking about how uh you were talking about how they made these contradictions to the bourgeois family right and i think about how like in the Freudian corpus they're all the family is never just a nuclear mom dad kids edible thing and a pet right it's always there are their governesses there's like some english teacher there's always like the help and they're the question of their sexual access and stuff is like th that produces a lot of trauma and 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 i think it, to give a more like germane contemporary example right in the beginning of time you have like the primal father right who i guess is kind of like the like, like the authoritarian dividing of sexual access to women at the beginning of history and then you know think about our contemporary moment we have all these like sex monster billionaire types right who so like there's like both at the beginning and the end of history is a um our, our, our authoritarian sex monster patriarchs, right? And, and so there's kind of like this timeless repetition of that, th that happens before and after. And some way in which the way in which like Freudian temporality works, like there can be this atavistic recursion or these things abide. And then the second thing I was thinking about, and this is a term I wanted to import into this to sort of think about is like aggression in some ways, because like Freud sort of, and this gets at, at Heinrich's question, right? Like basically says that from his perspective, communism is, is like in error or like the great Bolshevik experiment is doomed to failure because from his perspective, aggression precedes private property, yeah. right? Uh, and, and the private property, and, and, and I, I think this is, I'm certain this is probably a mischaracterization of the Marx or in the angles, but like he basically says that Marxists and communists seem to think that private property produces aggression, like private property, the, the creation of private property is like the original sin that, that then creates aggression. And I guess th that my question then was like, and aggression is one of these things that like that, you know, patriarchal sex monster ghost like seems to abide, right? So I, I wanted to ask you about like, is there a way to think about like this idea of aggression or like dominance as an impulse or something that's satisfied that we can see in the stagism that Engels has got going or in Engels specific stages? Like what's in it for the patriarch or like what's up with like the the desire to dominate through sex in some way? And, and how is that either contingent, like these other things you've been talking about, or is that something we can think of as being sort of timeless or more or less mutable? So that, that was my question and my thought on, on the question that Heinrich so astutely raised. Um, should I try to answer that or? <laughs> Go for it. Uh, I mean, I think it's a, a very good and complicated and challenging set of questions. I think, um, the place I would immediately suggest to turn to uh, for an attempt to kind of grapple with that is Gail Rubin, um, who you know is one of the um, in her classic essay "Traffic in Women" is really kind of one of the central figures to kind of grapple with Engels and try to really kind of cross Engels and Freud together in some ways. Um, so I think it might be useful for us to talk some more about Gail Rubin, and it seems like there's some enthusiasm in the chat for doing that. Um, but I guess just I, rather than try to do that myself, I want to say something more uh, broadly about, uh, I think, like different versions of the Marxist tradition that we can might find useful to think with here. Um, you know, it seems to me that um, 
really across the 20th century, you get a variety of Marxisms, which are one resistant to the stagism that's very potent and kind of pervasive in you know, the moment of the 1880s until World War I, more or less. Um, uh, resistant to sta uh, stagism and two, um, related to that, interested in a kind of more contradictory and composite way of thinking about consciousness, which brings in another kind of possible line of connection to the Freudian tradition, obviously. So while you're talking, Pat, I was thinking about, um, you know, Gramsci has this line that I, I love and always think about where he's describing the structure of consciousness and says, you know, parts of it, I'm just to paraphrase, but like parts of it are like from the Stone Age, right? And parts of it are from the newspaper that you read that morning. And parts of it are from, you know, what your priest tells you and parts of it are from your, your, your party organizer tells you and parts of it are from, you know, things that you're trying to figure out yourself in your job and in your family and whatever. Um, and, um, you know, I think that or another obvious place to go would be to Althusser, who obviously is like very directly engaged with, uh, psychoanalysis and psychoanalytic categories and is trying to transpose them onto Marxism in various ways. I think um, the traditions in Marxism that are uh, resisting stagism in that way, also I think it's striking that they give us different, um, they, they give us different renderings of consciousness that I think we tend to get from the kind of orthodox or classical moment. And I think that would be a rich thing to think more about why that is. Um, and what resources that makes available for addressing this question about the relationship between property and aggression. Because I don't think you necessarily have to have an answer about the fundamental priority of one over the other from that perspective. Happy. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. Um, Thank you so much, Gabe. I really appreciated your presentation. Um, and I'm so glad you brought up Gail Rubin. I feel like I, Patrick brought up male sex monsters and I wanna talk about like the opposite of that, basically. Um, you were talking early in your presentation about, I think you, the phrase was something like, Engels is failures of imagination. Um, and I think at least part of that circled around his, I guess what I would call doubling down on what we would call monogamy, not what he's calling monogamy. Um, so we get, and I was thinking about Gail Rubin, it's on page 19, if, if anyone wants to look at it, is like, there's like three paragraphs where we get the sort of like, okay, there's going to be, um, um, you know, here's the revolutionary horizon of sexuality um, in the wake of, um, in the wake of revolution. And you get this thing that actually reminds me a lot of not Gail Rubin's Traffic in Women, but the essay on the radical politics of sexuality, where she's talking about like the radical sexual pluralism um, that she thinks is necessary, you know, for us to usher in an era that obviously didn't happen. Um, but do you have any, here's my actual question. Do you have any insight into why Engels has this, I guess, since we're talking psychoanalytically, I would call it a blind spot, um, where he's so open to um, this radical revision of sexual relationships, except it still has to be in the pair form. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a, like, in some ways, the key question for evaluating Engels, and to go back to the earlier question from Michelina, I think, like the, the, the this frustrating quality of this kind of, of the socialist feminist thought of this kind of classical era of Marxism. Um, I mean, you know, I think that there's a couple of things we could say about it. One, one, I guess would just be to kind of repeat the answer that I gave already. So I won't do that about this, like the social composition of the, of the workers movement or the organized kind of party and trade union layers of the workers movement which I do think is actually a really underrated thing in understanding the formation of uh, radical thought in, like, in this space that actually like um, part of, I mean, we, it, well, let me say it like this. It would be very easy for us and convenient for us and probably in some regards true to just write off what this element of angles as like holdover, right? Like this is just a kind of Victorian thing and he's just kind of swimming around in that water and like no one has, you know, grabbed him by the lapels and shaken him out of it yet because the, the um, 
political and intellectual resource and cult cultural and sexual resources <laughs> for doing that. Like maybe just like, hey, he hasn't come across them. Uh, and that's probably true at some level, right? Uh, but it doesn't feel that satisfactory because uh, I think as you're saying, Abby, and as I, I would agree, and I, uh, like his line of analysis does actually in some ways seem to point further than where he goes. Um, and, or at least it, it's very easy to see how it might point further than where he goes. Um, and so for th that's the reason that I tend to kind of go to a social explanation or like even a sociological explanation instead. Um, and I think it, you know, has to do with, um, I mean, obviously there are all of these ambiguities in like 19th century Marxism about the scope of transformation that we're imagining and talking about, right? They're in Marx himself. Um, there are moments when it seems like what we're talking about is like a program of nationalization in which everything else kind of stays pretty similar. Um, and there are moments when it seems like we're talking about much, much more than that, right? Um, and I don't think Marx has that worked out, which is fine. Um, but I think that uh, Engels has that worked out probably even less to some degree. Uh, I don't think it's, I don't want to pile onto the like Engels fucked up Marxism kind of thing, which is something that you sometimes hear. But um, I do think that it does arise from the dialogue that they are um, in with like the elements and points of connection that they have to the workers' movement itself. Um, and you know, this is a, uh, I'll just wrap up this answer by saying this is a classic critique, not just of Marx and Engels, but of like the social democratic parties of the early 20th century, and in particular the German Social Democratic Party, which is a big one. Um, the way that they're, once they begin to actually become institutionalized and established and have kind of strongholds to defend and gains that they have made that they want to hang on to, all of which, you know, is honorable in some way, right? Or we can at least easily understand it. Um, the um, degree of transformation that Marxism seems to imply as their program starts to wobble a little bit, right? Such that you even basically get like this kind of right-wing deviation called revisionism, which is like, basically what if we turn Marxist social democracy like into the American democratic party of today, basically. Um, and, um, you know, I, I, I just, I think that's about how difficult it was to actually forge the connection between Marxism and the working class movement and how much that led Marxist intellectuals to take the working class movement and it's kind of particular and contingent forms of appearance as expressing the kind of inner logic of their program. I, I, I wanna add a little bit more to this sort of historical context of thinking about the sexual conservatism of the working class movement. I, I think uh, Gabe is exactly right to point to the Second International as being a sort of strata of better off workers by and large. And that, that part of what happened in the 1890s and 1880s was this beginning to sever uh, what was a, a quite blurry distinction between respectable workers on one hand and the sort of degenerate, disgusting, queer, poor people lump in on the other. Like, uh, and that the Second International and the Orthodox Socialist Movement really consolidated a, a, as a base amongst respectable workers. So that the lump in in Marx's work is a very blurry, chaotic category that is like everyone who's hustling it becomes more and more an actual elaborated social goal, right? So sex work, for a long time, sex work was extremely common in the life course of most working class women. And then by the 1890s, all sorts of campaigns against sex work, both by the bourgeoisie and the state and the socialist movement, it becomes like those who engage in sex work are radically unlike the respectable working class. And I think this distinction is not just an automatic sociological phenomenon of better paid workers. It is a political gambit by the base of the Second International to pose itself to the bourgeoisie as capable of governing, right? It's a political gambit to win suffrage, which is the center, centerpiece of the political strategy of the Second International and produces all these later contradictions. It is the gambit to say that we are capable of co-governing 
uh, with the bourgeoisie in its more revisionist or reformist tendencies. And it's the gambit of saying we can establish a worker's society and a worker's state governing over the whole of society, uh, that we are a governing class, which is not really a part of Marx's thinking to speak of. You know, it's an offhanded mention in the Goethe program. Uh, uh, but but it becomes this whole, and so how do you pose yourself as capable of governing? Well, you pose yourself as modeling your gender, sexual, and family codes off of the bourgeoisie. So this sort of mass adoption of the bourgeoisie, of the codes of the bourgeoisie in the working class as part of the struggle for governing. And I think this is all sorts of implications for psychoanalysis, where at the time Freud, you know, is thinking about the bourgeois family, it's this like narrow strata of society, but all these points that he makes actually become generalized descriptors of family life in the 1940s and 50s or 50s and 60s of huge sections of the industrial working class who have sort of adopted this family life as a political program. And so that all these sort of things about Freud actually start describing general phenomenon in society. Um, anyhow. Okay, so let's hear one hand up. Uh, Henrik. I just wanted to sort of uh, bridge or spin off what you said, Michelle, because I was thinking when I was reading the Sika, uh, I was struck by that line that doctors were more inclined to counsel women to stop having children while refusing to tell them how. And that brought to mind the contemporary um, sort of environmentalist movement where people are constantly being told to stop doing certain things such as consuming, uh, wasting electricity, uh, using petrol cars, etc. But <clears throat> they are never told how. And we're never given the means to, much as uh, in a similar way as the working class wasn't given the means to control its own reproduction, um, people now aren't given the means to control their environment and their impact on the environment. And I think that there's a similar case to be made uh, in both in um, how the environmental movement is trying to pose itself as a respectable bridge between the people uh, in power and the people affected by the change. And also how uh, there's a similar sort of demand for action uh, in the fertility crisis of the 1920s and the ecological crisis now. Uh, and a similar gap between men and women in terms of power to uh, affect change and uh, motivation to uh, make the change. I was just struck by the similarities uh, in how there was this uh, dem great demographic change that seemed to come about um, sort of on its own power and there's no explanation according to Sikkim uh, as to, there's no primary cause which you can point out to Say this grown up, <clears throat> and there's a similar need for a similar um, mass reorganization of uh, priorities in society, but there's no sort of um, way to um, affect this change. Uh, now, I don't know if this if this makes any sense in relation to this, but I was just struck by the similarities uh, when I was reading it. Yeah, I mean, I think these are like, at some level, these are kind of deep dilemmas of, um, or contradictions of, of like political action in capitalist society, maybe. Um, and we could probably come up with further versions of the comparison that you just drew, Henrik. I don't really have anything that insightful to say, except that I think I, I understand the resonance that you're describing for us. And I think it, you know, it arises in some form also in the politics of family abolition itself, probably. Kalina? Um, sort of, I think that sort of one way to sort of bring psychoanalysis 
into this conversation historically is also sort of connecting it to that question of sort of, um, you know, refusing the working class access to knowledge and sort of um, resources to sort of, you know, influence their own sexuality and reproduction and sort of, you know, forms of kinship. Um, because like, what else is the sort of Soviet sort of, you know, refusal of psychoanalysis in some sense, you know? Um, the sort of famous converse memoir of Tetkin about Lenin, where they sort of talk about, you know, psychoanalysis um, and sort of, you know, refusing that sort of obsessive focus on sexuality can be read in a very sort of similar light, I think. Um, you know, with um, sort of refusal to, you know, give the working class access to just knowledge about contraception and um, and that sort of, you know, similar forms of alienating the working class from um, any means of, um, of actually, you know, conceptualizing um, as well as understanding their sexuality. Are we, should I respond to each comment or are we, I don't quite know what, what format we're you. in. <laughs> I, it's open. I mean, we don't have a lot of hands up. Um, oh, let's, let's take one more from Carla since it's a current hand up. Um, so you can speak up whenever you want. <laughs> Apologies for interrupting you earlier. Hi. Um, yeah, although I kind of, if there is a response to, um, to Michalina's comment, because my, mine's going to loop back uh, to Hendrix's question, so I don't want uh, that com that comment to get lost. So, yeah, I mean, I don't. Uh, I think it's a, just to go back to the last two comments. I mean, Michalina and then Hendrix before, which I, you know, was still sort of processing when I started talking before. Um, I do think it's a real, you know, to, to to try to expand on my point from a moment ago. I do think it's a real important kind of dilemma in the politics of revolution. Um, right? We do like if revolution is anything. It is the transformation of its own participants, right, as well as the the institutions that govern them and in, in which uh, you know which are being overturned or replaced or, or whatever. Um, and what it means for you know a revolutionary people to transform themselves, um, and uh, you know for the kind of forms of knowledge and. Um, autonomy and self-rule and also violence that are involved in that to uh, be emancipated, you know, how, 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 to do, how those can be directed in emancipatory ways, I think raises really interesting and challenging questions. Again, when you brought into conversation with um, psychoanalytic forms of knowledge, because uh, it, into revolution, of course, we all, right, carry a variety of forms of um, psychical history, I guess you could say, or, you know, damage or the various forms of violence that we've endured that have led up to the point of revolution, one can easily imagine, um, which are probably not all going to be in, in sync with one another in any clear kind of way. Um, and I think that, um, I don't know the answer to that obviously, but it seems to me like um, it's interesting and I think probably quite possible to read the politics of revolutionary processes like, you know, 1917 or any that we might choose, uh, which we often read in terms of like um, social classes and right, our right to do so in some way, like how is the proletariat going to relate to the peasantry? Um, the ways that proletarians have been disciplined into, um, you know, the forms of potentiation and repression that form them and make them revolutionary actors as, ways to, as opposed to the ways the peasants have been, right? And the role of the priest and the teacher and the father in the lives of the proletarian and the peasant are quite different. Um, and I think, uh, you know, in thinking about any revolutionary process, one probably has to think about um, the, though, like, not just at the level of class in a kind of sociological way, but probably also at the level of the psyche or at the level of, of, of the con constitution of consciousness. Um, those kinds of questions, which it's very easy to see. I mean, I guess all that's to say, it's very easy to see how at some point, you know, Lenin might say like, look, we can't get into all of that, Jesus. <laughs> um, or, um, 
you know, we have or to make a choice, right, about um, the kind of forms of authority that the state is going to adopt for itself in relation to a kind of variety of psychic histories that people bring into a revolutionary process. Yeah, I think I just wanted to, when, when Hendrik, you were making your comment, it was bringing me back to the question that was asked about the relationship between, between aggression and private property earlier. And right, like, does it proceed? So like, if, if our relationship to land is one where we think of it as private property, then do we like, then actually, do we need to think the Freudian frameworks and be like, oh, well, domination is that, that notion of domination is coming. It does it precede private property. Is it coming from private property? Does that not matter? But it, um, I guess I just, I was curious to hear if others, if either Gabe or, or others, if we could think, think through that kind of private property and, and land and individual both. And obviously with something like our ecological situation, we need both individual and collective uh, transformation. And, no answers, just Can I just say one thing about that that I thought I meant to say earlier and forgot, which is that I think it's very striking that Engels can't give us a story about why inheritance matters. Um, you know, that it's like the central mover actually in the kind of key moment of the text of the world historic, you know, the overthrow of mother right and the world historic defeat of the female sex. But uh, it's, I think, the most taken for granted kind of concept actually in the entire text at some level that inheritance obviously must matter. Um, and I think that probably would bear some useful interrogation. Elias. Um, I, just, I just had a quick thought, which is like, there, there's, a, there's a category that I think plays a pretty important role in a lot of this kind of, uh, you know, second international moment, uh, anthropologically informed, uh, you know, interest in like, long durée history of um, you know modes of production which is this category of like primitive communism or or communismus in german right which doesn't figure in the text i think that we read um but that seems like a kind of important uh thing to bring up in this discussion of the question of like the you know the pr primacy or the, rel the relative priority of um aggression or private property right like if part of what you're trying to extract from your uh reading in anthropological research is um you know the notion that there was this uh or, or you know if, if your strategy for sort of debunking the, the necessity of, of of capitalism is to say that in fact and the, and the possibility of communism is that in fact there was this state prior to all of this um where there was a totally different not only like relationship of production, um, but also, uh, a, you know, a different kind of like affective or emotional, um, st I mean, not this is not obviously not everyone who like writes about primitive communism is like, and they were all happy um, all the time. And like, nobody ever thought, you know, um, but like that, that, that's part of the goal, you know, it's not just like, oh, there's the stage, to, like one of the stages is something like communism. And we know, therefore, you know, if we know that this stage happen when then we know we can have something like it again even if it's not going to be exactly the same right but like that that seems like a like a super important part of like one kind of pretty common narrative that at least some of the kind of like marxist and marxist affiliated thinkers were, were drawing on um which obviously is like very much not the kind of picture of the primal um uh that the freud um uh le leaves us with and i and i feel like the kind of the removal of the image of primitive communism from um or the complication of its like position in in this in, in the kind of like Mar marxist historiography does something important to kind of like where we place the kind of persistence of like aggression and negativity and um and conflict um and so on yeah i mean i don't have more kind of uh insightful thoughts about that, which is worth mentioning. Emily? Yeah, I, I just wanted to return to Seacomb for a second, because I was so like grateful to read that kind of empirical account along with the angles. Um, and I think that this question of um, 
you know, the sort of question of the ahistorical or the, the, the permanent horizon of aggressivity or of certain psychic structures relative to like a history of modes of production. I think um, if we replace like aggression or if, if in talking about aggressivity, we're also talking about desire. I think Sikom has some really interesting things to say about this at the end of the article, you know, when he's basically like uh, taking apart the, the language and the logics of like the, you know, new home economics, uh, kind of neoclassical idea of like, you know, talking about baby making in terms of supply and demand and rational choices, um, you know, and he takes on some of that language, like he's willing to engage it, right? But he's also, um, you know, uh, basically is like, what does it mean to say that these women wanted to have babies? Like, what would it mean? What does it mean to even give an account of desire that's so radically constrained um, by, you know, what he calls procreative fatalism? Like, if you think you're going to have to have a baby, then you're going to want a baby, right? Like, that the idea that desire could be somehow extricated from um, the set of material conditions that produce it or that, that shape, like, what forms those desires can even take. Um, and then the way that like the whole sort of historical inquiry that he's doing is to somehow unearth like the prehistory of that desire before it like has the material conditions to come to fruition, I think is just really um, like a, a helpful way of of thinking this not of the relation. I just think it's a good example. I don't I don't really have like a question or comment. I just, just to like return us to Seacomb as like one of the ways of thinking about how to um, how to think the relation between between psychic structure um, and 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 mode of production. So it's an interesting element sort of that has come up a number of times around pleasure and desire, like both Kochev's sort of rethinking of the dialectic, Seacombe saying really explicitly the fact that sex is pleasurable to people really radically complicates any notions about demand for children, right? Like having sex is a, is a big deal. It's really quite nice. And the sort of thinking about, uh, right? So the Kochev that domination entails pleasures, produces new opportunities for pleasure for those engaged in it. And, and then also, like, to what extent can we even meaningfully talk about desire in a highly constrained environment, like Emily's comments about, uh, and, and Seacombe's, uh, what does it mean to desire something in a, in a context in which you're trapped in it? And these are all questions that, like, psychoanalysis should have a tremendous amount to say about, uh, but that the kind of failure of psychoanalysis to think enough about the social link, about uh, the relationship of society outside of, you know, this little bit of social commentary written by psychoanalytic theorists means that in a lot of clinical practice, those, that kind of thinking is not really integrated what that really means. Like what does desire means that when it necessarily exceeds the individual, when it locates you, when it embeds you in a social structure in which you're invested or not. Hey, other, other hands, comments? Maybe one or two more before we wrap up. Do you want to comment um, about any of this, Patrick? I see your multiple posts. Oh, it's just one post, sorry. And Carlin, do you want to comment at all? There's a lot going on in the chat. Yeah, go ahead. We save the chat, so we'll figure out how to sort of condense so many resources. Thank you so much. I see, Abby, you just took your uh, mic off. And then oh, maybe that was for, that was for that. Patrick. No, okay. Oh, okay sure. I, I guess like the one thing I'm thinking about here, which is it, it, it's a perverse move, right? But like, and I'm not suggesting a moral equivalence here, but as we think about like the constraints of what's imaginable or desirable for people who are sort of outside of power and who are, you know, in, in positions of, of being dominated, this seems to, it, 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 
harkens back to this sort of that question of like the reversion to this like atavistic and the sex monster idea where it's like well the people the elites in power their desire their pleasure seem kind of constrained and banal and repetitively determined over the long durée of 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 time right like they're, they're, they're just being able to dominate the people around you is a tired played out thing yet that's what they're they think power is right and and that's what's given to them as being pleasurable and therefore that's what they do uh and and i think there's something really striking about being able to think about them as being constrained imaginatively even as we think about them as imposing conditions of constraint on others beneath them as that's all i was going to say but yeah even so Uh, yeah, my comment is a kind of a perfect just topper on on what Patrick was going off of because my my thought was about these uh, these billionaire sex pests. Uh, probably the part of the conversation we were talking about, like um, the the problem, the political problem of, of transformation of of the family in this case, or sexuality or whatever, and how the sort of family values buyout always kind of comes in and kind of and kind of swoops in and 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 reduces that that movement past the transformation to to something quiet um but uh apropos to these billionaire sex pests i think as a sort of news clipping to introduce to this uh errol musk's recent comments about in response to it being found out of having fathered a, ch a child with his stepkid uh in his own defense seemingly said you know we're put on the planet to reproduce and i just found that immediately so kind of sad and sisyphean as a, as a way of try to like framing his 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 appearance in the media uh, but in any case i just want to throw that out there and like you know if, if this is happening in the news maybe there's something uh you know there's a moment here to kind of like shift things around uh michael uh you're muted michael by gesturing avidly <laughs> Um, yeah, it's uh, it's just been an amazing discussion all round. Um, I, I wanted to build a little bit on what you were saying, Emmy O'Brien, about um, how how Oedipus kind of gets generalized, um, and how Engel, Zetkin, and others are playing a role in this by trying to kind of co-opt bourgeois um, norms of respectability and so on, um, and my question is kind of coming from something Seekham wrote about, and I'm interested in the trajectory of the male breadwinner norm. So Seekham saying that um, as, as women learn these techniques for stopping, and um, they became able to re-enter paid work instead of having more children. And thanks to this, the male breadwinner norm began to dissolve. I'm coming to this with a sort of, I don't know how accurate it is, but a notion that the male breadwinner norm gets kind of reimposed um, in the 1930s, the post-war period with, with the, um, the family wage and Fordism and so on. Um, it, it, so is this kind of accurate? Um, is and, you know, the, the male bread, breadwinner model having something to do with Oedipus here? Um, is it accurate that kind of in the process Seekham's describing, um, that norm is kind of dissolving and it gets kind of reimposed or does it not get reimposed so much thereafter? Is it impossible to generalize? Um, I don't know. Thanks. Um, I, think it, I think it is possible to generalize. I think it's, uh, there are different temporalities of this. Um, I mean, first of all, I think it's important to say that it's always being imposed in some way, right? That's a kind of key dimension of political struggle throughout the history of the modern state. Um, and, various kind of working class organizations and parties and, and so on are often, as our discussion has been developing, playing complex or ambiguous or contradictory mediating roles in that process in a variety of ways. Um, you know, there's a great in the just in US history, for example, there's a kind of great, very complex scholarly literature on the development of the social security system and the, it's kind of different elements and dimensions. Um, and the very ambiguous roles that trade unions and even the Communist Party have in supporting and opposing and modifying and attempting to radicalize and, and so on in that in that process. But I think to try to kind of sketch out the longer durée history, I, I don't think Seacomb is saying that the single breadwinner kind of, <laughs> I would say, Oedipal formation um, 
has been generalized by the 1930s, or rather has been generalized by the turn of the century. And then, it, you know, some, um, I think, with, sorry, I lost track of different temporal threads. I think Seacombe is pointing quite far in the future. Uh, he's saying that um, while the, the um, single breadwinner kind of model arises as a kind of viable model in the late 19th century for strata of the working class, it then begins to generalize over the course of the entire first half of the 20th century, but simultaneously within it, because of the ways that it's based upon a certain kind of control of fertility and a certain assertion um, in a kind of struggle between husband and wife of the wife's ability to control fertility, it simultaneously also lays the groundwork for a late 20th century phenomenon, which is obviously familiar to all of us. Um, and there too, right, as we know from Melinda Cooper and others, there's a kind of attempted uh, re-imposition dynamic, which uh, plays out in important ways across the late 20th century and into the present. But I think to wrap up the conversation some, um, or to kind of make my contribution toward that, um, the attempted reimposition of a single breadwinner model is actually not totally possible, right? That's not to say it's constantly being attempted and enforced in a variety of ways. But I think this is what I find most useful about Seacomb at some level, is that he's showing us how um, the struggle over fertility and reproduction within the family uh, does actually transform the mode of production in quite deep ways. Um, it's, you know, even it's limited and contained in partial, the limited and contained in partial successes uh, that people positioned as wives have in that struggle. Nonetheless, um, by the end of the 20th century have brought about a quite dramatic transformation in the relation between labor and capital and not one that is necessarily unambiguously good by any stretch, right? Um, but, if you read Seacombe's contributions to the um, domestic labor debate in New Life Review in the 1970s or 80s, um, it's quite interesting. What he set, he points toward is the ways that the increasing commodification of reproductive labor over the course of the late 20th century um, does, it sort of is bound to transform and expand further the kind of arenas and zones of struggle in which um, people who have previously been housewives may now engage. And I do think that that dialectic in which, um, that, that dialectic at the core of his work in which um, control of fertility both produces a, cer a certain kind of nuclear family heteropatriarchal model and also contains seeds of its uh, transcendence and struggle on a wider scale is I think a very generative thing that we might point toward in trying to think about the ways that um, questions of who is responsible for mothering uh, and for the kind of the work of family uh, actually are, are increasingly important as a kind of large scale zone of struggle across numerous fields of our, you know, our social formations. And I think you can get that actually almost entirely out of Seacomb. Um, so I guess that would be where I would point us now. Um, I, I had lots of thoughts I wanted to include in this discussion to wrap up, but I have to admit that it's like 95 degrees in the attic that I'm in. And so I keep losing my train of thought. Um, so maybe I'll stop there and I'm happy for others to, to jump in. Let's, let's wrap up there. Um, let's do a slightly shorter program without the small breakout groups and end on Gabe's excellent comments. So thank you, everyone, uh, particularly thank you to, you, to our speaker, uh, presenter, and um, thanks to everyone for coming. So next week, uh, we're going to be meeting in two weeks to talk about some of the predecessors to what became social reproduction theory, talking about Kolontai and um, Dalla Costa both writing about the family and its place in social reproduction in the context of mass working class insurgency. So um, come then, um, should be fun and uh, have a great couple of weeks. And if you haven't, fill out the second of the links that Hannah posted, maybe post it again if you're able to, Hannah. 
um, and to let us know sort of generally uh, your thoughts about the seminars and moving forward. Um, yeah. Lots of love for your presentation, Gabriel Winnett. Okay, so thank you everyone. Thanks everyone. Take care.